Television brings the candidates into millions of homes. The moments we remember from televised debates are woven into our political folklore. You know people from the knockout know. lines. There you go again. Senator, you're no Jack Kennedy. To the cringeworthy gaffes. The third agency of government, yeah. I, would, I would do away with the education, uh, the uh, I, I, commerce, and let's see. Rumors on the uh, internets. I can't. Oops. But what if the way debates are often covered? Let's start with the style points. So has missed what we really gained from them. The way we're trained to think about the debates has been this idea that image triumphs over substance. And I think that's false. Voters look listen and make up their minds as each of the nominees outlines his program, explains his position on vital campaign issues. The first public debate between presidential nominees was a creation of the television age. Debate seen and heard by millions of people. Good evening. And that first 1960 face-off between Nixon and Kennedy became a parable about the new medium's outsized influence. Kennedy is this sort of handsome young candidate. Uh, he's going up against the sitting vice president, Richard Nixon. I, of course, disagree with Senator Kennedy. Nixon hadn't wanted to use makeup. He thought this would make him seem unmanly. So he had put on what they called lazy shave, kind of this powder makeup. Over the years, conventional wisdom about the debate took shape. Kennedy won because he looked better. You see it in books by scholars. You see it repeated by network executives, uh, Don Hewitt, who was the producer of the debates themselves. That election turned on makeup. The best evidence for this story? It's often said that TV viewers favored Kennedy, while listeners on the radio called the debate for Nixon. If you listen to it on radio, those people overwhelmingly picked Nixon to win. Nixon yep. won on the radio, right? But people who watched on television thought Kennedy had won. I assume this to be true. I probably taught this to lots of college students who took my classes and my lectures. But, the government has but how exactly do we know Nixon won on the radio? David Greenberg dug into this question in his book, Republic of Spin. As it turns out, that's a pretty dubious and probably false claim. People have tried to track down those radio surveys. They found that maybe there's one marketing survey of a couple of hundred people. We don't know whether these were people who were already leaning toward Nixon. Was this an older sample? Nobody's really been able to pin this down or back it up. Our generation of Americans has the Just same by role. standing side by side with the vice president and at least holding his own, if not more, Kennedy was able to convince a lot of people that he was presidential timber. The Republican leadership has opposed federal aid for education, medical care for the aged, development of the Tennessee Valley, development of our natural resources. Mr. Nixon, would you like to comment on that statement? I have no comment. The idea that Kennedy won because he had the better makeup job, I think has left us with a distorted view of how the presidential debates work. I would urge all prospective candidates in the future be sure that you remember that more important than what you say is how you look on television. At that point, that debate was the most watched broadcast in television history. The 1960 debates were widely called decisive in the election. Some argued they would corrupt the public judgment. And candidates wouldn't agree to another debate until 16 years later. What people typically think is that this was the triumph of the television image over substantive politics. The idea that political wins or losses can be chalked up to television image may help explain the way some media and pundits are framing the debates in the lead up to the 2020 election. Castro, he was polished, he was prepared, he looked presidential. You mentioned Kamala Harris. That first debate, um, she, was, she was strong, but there was a warmth there. And if some dismissed televised debates in 1960 as a spectacle, Critics say debate coverage in recent elections has become more like a circus. This is it. Round three. The frills that surround the debates have 
really magnified in intensity over the years, and it just seems like every election cycle, it gets that much crazier. Two nights, 10 candidates each night. Watch the lineup take shape in an unprecedented live event. We'll draw a name and a date to determine which night each candidate will appear. A lot of this stuff is just goofy. I want a word or phrase to describe tonight's debate. Sophomoric, low on substance. Disgusting. Schoolyard brawl. CNN, for instance, has done this little squiggly line that rises or falls on the basis of whether people are responding favorably or negatively. This is the perception analyzer. If Andy is unhappy during the debate with what she's hearing, she'll turn it to the left. If she feels like, wow, what the candidate is saying is really resonating with her, she'll turn it all away. Wonderful job, Andy. Up to 100. Then there are the so-called spin rooms. I'm down here in the flea market of propaganda. We're all where campaign operatives shill for their candidates after the debates are done. You're here in the spin room, and there is a lot of spinning going on. He's in spin alley tonight. David, go ahead, spin me. This idea of spinning the debates in a way that's favorable to a particular candidate, it's worthless. It's content that uh, that has no, uh, you know, has a lot of calories, but it doesn't have any dietary value. Nevertheless, Many observers insist these televised face-offs remain a valuable resource. The debates give voters something that no other political mechanism does. Candidates can prepare, and they do prepare, and they can walk in with things they want to say, but they can't really control the situation. Anything can happen, and history shows that there are a lot of moments along the way where the candidates were thrown off their game. I am pleased to welcome you to the second presidential debate. Michael Dukakis was thought to be a, a sort of a cold, emotionless technocrat that people could not warm up to. If Kitty Dukakis were raped and murdered, would you favor an irrevocable death penalty for the killer? And he gave this very cold, rational response. No, I don't, Bernard, and I think you know that I've opposed the death penalty during all of my life. Uh, I don't see any evidence that it's a deterrent and... So debates can be dangerous. There's no better example than in 1976 when Jerry Ford, then president, said that... There is no Soviet domination of Eastern Europe and there never will be under a Ford administration. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I want, could I just follow? Did I understand you to say, sir, that the Russians are not using Eastern Europe as their own sphere of influence and occupying mo most of the countries there. Ford dug in his heels and didn't want to apologize or clarify it right away. It gave Democrats the opportunity to reopen those questions about whether Ford was really up to the job. In politics, performance, image, appearance are expressions of substance. Candidates' image conveys their approach to solving problems, the way they can present themselves and communicate their ideas, their temperament. Who's to say that these aren't important qualities to think about as we're choosing a president? Whether or not debates truly sway elections is an open question. And candidates' ability to reach masses of voters themselves could one day mean they'll decide that debates simply aren't worth the risk. The idea that a candidate can decide that they're not going to debate is not unthinkable whatsoever. What would be lost would be the ability for the American people to see the candidates unvarnished, accountable to each other, and tested against each other. It's just awfully good that someone with the temperament of Donald Trump is not in charge of the law in our country. Yeah, because you'd be in jail. Secretary Clinton. <laughs> In 2016, the debates between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton were major media events, with one drawing a record 84 million viewers. And the debates between the president and the Democratic nominee, Joe Biden, will be among the most anticipated events of the 2020 campaign. We get at least a little peek into the window of how these people operate and how they think and how they communicate. That's a rare and precious thing.